1863 civilians of Gettysburg were reluctant witnesses to the great battle. Join Ken Rich, the man in the red shirt, for his historic town walking tours. You could book these tours by emailing ken at gettysburgtownhistory.com. That's ken at gettysburgtownhistory.com. And when you're in town, look for the guy in the red shirt. This episode of Addressing Gettysburg is brought to you in part by me, audiobook narrator Mike Scott. Narrator of Savas Beatty's Bloody Autumn, the Shenandoah Valley Campaign of 1864, and, unlike anything that ever floated, The Monitor and Virginia and the Battle of Hampton Roads. If you are an author or publisher interested in having your titles produced as audiobooks, or even just in learning more about the process, give me a shout. You can find my contact info on my website, mikescottvoice.com. That's Mike Scott Voice. Com. Enjoy historical stories on the History Fix platform. Explore movies, short films, and documentaries. Addressing Gettysburg podcast fans receive an extra $5 off the first year's annual subscription. Sign up at HistoryFix.com and use promo code Gettysburg. Every subscription includes a seven-day risk-free trial. Escape into history with History Fix. Want the freshest cup of coffee in Gettysburg? Then visit Bantam Roasters, formerly 82 Cafe at 82 Steinware Avenue. They roast all of their coffee in-house, and they have a full coffee bar to keep you caffeinated during your trip. Visit them at www.raggededgerc.com for their menu and shipping options for all of their freshly roasted coffee. Use promo code HANCOCK for 10% off your order in the cafe. Are you ready for your next great Civil War read? Then try the new historical novel, The Heavens Falling, by Jonathan Lucci. Follow the members of the Dawson family through the Civil War, from the halls of Congress to the bloody fields of battle, and from the decks of gunboats to the solitude of Lincoln's office. The Heavens Falling is available on Amazon in paperback and Kindle, or visit theheavensfalling.com to order. That's theheavensfalling.com. And Civil War Trails. It's the world's largest open-air museum, and they offer over 1,300 sites across six states. Drive the Gettysburg Campaign turn by turn, paddle to Frederick Douglass's birthplace, or hike to remote earthworks and artillery positions. Visit civilwartrails.org to request a brochure and explore their interactive map. Follow Civil War Trails and create some history of your own. From the Gettysburg Museum of History Studios, you're listening to Addressing Gettysburg. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of Addressing Gettysburg's Ask a Gettysburg Guide. And today we are talking about Daniel's Brigade, led by Brigadier General Junius Daniel. That's my middle name, Matthew Junius Junius. Calorie. Yes. (laughs) A lot of people don't know that. That's what the J stands for, Junius. Uh, With me is uh, our old friend, and I do mean old, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Lewis Trot. Hello, Lewis. Hello. Lewis is a licensed battlefield guide, of course. And more importantly, Lewis leads our get out of the car tours uh, every month between, uh, no, not every month, actually. So we do it April, May, June, August, September, October uh, every year. The schedule for that is up on addressinggettysburg.com. Go ahead, check it out. And we hope to see your smiling face there at some point this season. Okay, so Lewis, we're talking about Daniel's Brigade. Um, and uh, they're in Rhodes' division. Yes. And what is he com- the comprised of the 32nd North Carolina, 43rd North Carolina, 45th North Carolina, 53rd North Carolina, 2nd North Carolina Battalion, 2,052 men. It's a big brigade. It's a big brigade. Yeah. You would think that uh, with that many men, they'd be able to single-handedly wipe out the entire First Corps you of would the think. Union Army. But you that's not think. how it happened. No. Um, what are they... Uh, well, do give us a little background on their brigade first. Well, their background is uh, pretty scattered. Um, at Gettysburg is the first time they fight in a major battle as a brigade. So it's not one of the veteran brigades that Lee has in his army. Um, but, they're, but they've been around for like a year, though, haven't they? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, some of the regiments came into being in June, July of 1862. So, uh, yes, they've been around for a year. Um but they get assigned to the Army of Northern Virginia as a brigade in May of 1862 after the Battle of Chancellorsville. Uh-huh. Once Lee decides he's going to, you know, pull in all the men he can and head north. So where were they um, before? North Carolina? They were in North Carolina. At one point, they're under D.H. Hill, Daniel uh-huh. Harvey Hill. Um, they uh, portions of the brigade fight at New Bern. Um, so they're doing different things down in North Carolina. Um, a little bit about Junius Daniels. He was born in 1828 in Halifax, North Carolina. He goes to West Point. 
he enters West Point in 1846. And a classmate of his is future General Governor Warren. Um, now, he's supposed to graduate in 1850, but he has a training accident. So he doesn't, he gets laid up for a year. He doesn't graduate with Warren. He graduates the next year in 1851. So he is a West Point grad. He's sort of a, a middle of the pack guy at the clan of the class. And uh, so what that means is he's probably going to be an infantry guy. He's going to be a grunt because the top tier get their pick. And back then it was a sexy thing to pick engineer. Mm. Engineers were the, the high class of the army. So um, he doesn't have that option. He's going to be a grunt. But he's going to spend some time in the army. He's going to go out west. He doesn't stay in the army, though. He resigns his uh, commission to go work on his father's plantation in Louisiana. And that's where he's at when the war breaks out. Okay. So he's act- he's not in North Carolina. He's from North Carolina, though. He just happens to be taking care of his father's place out in Louisiana. So when the war breaks out, he um, gives that up, offers his, his service to his home state of North Carolina. And eventually he's elected um, colonel of the 14th North Carolina. So that's where he starts his Civil War careers with the 14th, which is not one of the regiments that he's going to bring to Gettysburg. Um, eventually he's going to move up and he's going to be elected colonel of the 40, I think it's the 45th North Carolina. And to give an example of how well he's thought of, there's two other regiments that want him as their colonel too. Mm. But he goes with the 45th, and eventually he gets put in charge of this brigade that's going to come with Lee um, to Gettysburg. He's assigned to Robert Rhodes' division. Robert Rhodes is a new division commander. Rhodes has five brigades under his command. He has O'Neill, Iverson, Doles, Daniel, and Stephen Ramsher's brigade. As we'll see at Gettysburg, and as we talked about last summer in our Get Out of the Car tour, um, Rhodes' division is going to turn out to be a mixed bag. And it's happenstance that they arrive here as they do um, in the, the two weak, weaker brigades due to leadership within those brigades end up being in the front of the division march that day, right. July 1st. And um, so the, to, to make it easy, the two weak links are O'Neill and Iverson. And then on either side of them, you have Doles to their left as they're facing um, the Union Army to the east. And you have O'Neill, Iverson. Then you have Daniels. He's on the far right towards the west. And in and, and reserve is Ramsier. So you have these two stronger brigades, Doles and Daniels. And in between them, Iverson and O'Neill that okay. have terrible days. Um and it's just the way it works out. So in those four brigades are going to be lined up when Doles arrives and wants to attack the Union line on Oak Ridge. And again, that was the subject of um, last summer's get out of the car tour. Um, so I'm, that's not the point of this podcast. We're not going to rehash that. I would like to say, and and I'm not that smart. OK. OK. Um you didn't have to agree so readily, <laughs> um, but I'm not, I don't have many original thoughts. I'm not a big thinker. I, 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 I get by on self-discipline. Um, you don't have to think to be good at that. True. But I had this original thought when I was putting together last summer's tour about Rhodes Division, and it was specifically about the attack of O'Neill and Iverson. And we all know the story that Iverson comes down and he doesn't lead his, um, his brigade More importantly, he doesn't throw out skirmishers. They get tore up in what is known as Iverson's Pits now. We got to walk there last summer. It was pretty cool. Um, And they get handled very roughly. So there's rumors that Iverson's drunk. He's not with them. He's definitely not leading them. I don't think it's ever been proven 100% that he's drunk or anything. Right. What is true is there's no skirmishers, and that's a horrible idea, and he's not leading them. So in my research for that... Uh, walk we did last summer, Iverson wasn't always like that. Earlier in the war, and I think it's a Gaines Mills. I'd have to go back and read my notes. But uh, earlier in the war, when he's in charge of a brigade, he is leading them. Right. And he's out front, and he gets wounded. Uh-huh. And that lays him up for a while. Uh-huh. And I think by the time he gets here, 
He's gun shy. Yeah, sure. He's, I'm not getting out there again. <laughs> now he's got a horrible personality. He 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 uh, creates a lot of um, confusion and conspiracy within his brigade. He wants certain people elevated. They're his friends, not necessarily from North Carolina. He has a North Carolinian brigade, so he's not well liked. But I don't think he's out in front of his brigade because he at this point he's gun shy and he doesn't want to get shot again. Right. So, yeah, I don't blame him. And that's just. My opinion and conjecture about what I've based on what I've read, it's, it doesn't say that anywhere, of course. Um, but next to him in line as they're approaching that area to attack is the Brigade of Junius Daniels when they arrive on the um, 1st of July. Mm-hmm. And so, what do they do on the 1st of July? What, what is their uh, major action? What are they? They're on the right flank of Rhodes' division. They're on right? the right flank of Rhodes' division. They're told to support Iverson. Right. Um, and so Iverson's directly to their left. He's to their left. When Iverson's brigade initiates their line of march coming towards Oak Ridge, they wheel to the left. They oblique to the left. And that brings them coming towards that stone wall that we talk about on Oak Ridge. So mm-hmm. it, at first they're coming at that wall at an angle. And now they're turning to the left to come at it square on. When they do that, they separate. Their right flank separates from the end of Daniel's brigade. Okay. So now they're going two different directions, and that gap becomes wider. Daniel's brigade ends up going more towards the southwest, and they're heading towards the railroad bed, the unfinished railroad bed out Mm -hmm. there. Um, next to the Chambersburg Pike. They're headed more in that direction rather than Oak Ridge. And it's because when they start off, both of them are sort of going that way. But then, again, Iverson's brigade sort of obliques to the left, and they're heading towards Stoke Ridge. They see that tower there. They say, oh, if we could get that tower. <laughs> <laughs> we could see a lot. We'd be able to see everything. Um, but that's that's how these they get separated. Um <clears throat> So that that widens that gap. And instead of going up against Baxter's brigade on Oak Ridge, Daniel's brigade ends up fighting primarily against Stone's brigade for uh, three regiments that are by the Chambersburg Pike, 150th, 149th, 143rd, Pennsylvania. Right. So it, what was it, two regiments or three of Daniel's go with Iverson? towards uh, the woods. Two of them sort of head that way, but they don't really go with. Yeah, they don't connect. And there's another, there's one of O'Neill's regiments that gets pulled over there. Yeah, so that so that's, uh, you know, okay, so let's see here. Uh, this is a long one here, but I highlighted this because I just wanted it to use it as uh, an example of um, just how chaotic these battles could be, you know? Yeah. Movies don't always show this. Um, okay, so bear with me here, folks. While the 43rd North Carolina <clears throat> dallied around the Forney House, the 53rd North Carolina made its way towards Iverson's right flank, all the while torn by small arms and cannon fire. As the regiment approached Oak Ridge, it encountered the 3rd Alabama, O'Neill's brigade, which was also to the right of Iverson. Now, where's O'Neill's brigade supposed to be? O'Neill's brigade... Is to the left of Iverson. Iverson, right down so, near uh, to give a visual near the McLean farm. So, how did the Third Alabama get over to the right of Iverson's brigade? Rhodes plucks them out and sends them over there. Okay, yeah. So it's not that there's confusion, uh, and and they somehow find themselves on the other side of the no, brigade. They're sent over there by Rhodes, and Rhodes is Rhodes is micromanaging O'Neill's brigade. He was he was once the brigade commander of that brigade, so maybe he had a certain mm. feeling towards them. Maybe he's not that confident in O'Neill, right? But he's he's sort of micromanaging, and then not to get sidetracked, but based on that, O'Neill says, "I, I guess you got in c- control of this brigade." He sort of steps back because he doesn't lead his brigade either, right? Um, right, and that's going to cost him a promotion that's you know ready to be given to him. Yeah, but he never gets it, so. All right, so, uh, uh, okay, so the 3rd Alabama, which was also to the right of Iverson, it first formed on the Alabama's, Alabama unit's left. Uh, we're talking about, what, the 53rd uh, North Carolina here. Uh, it first formed on the Alabama unit's left, but then moved around to its right. 
So there you go. There's another thing. With just So we're going on the left of this retro. No, no, no. Now we're going to go around to the right. So there's a lot of confusion. That's going to take time. That's going to take effort, and I'm sure there's a lot of stuff flying through the air while that's going on. Although Iverson's charge had been repulsed, the two regiments continued their advance toward Oak Ridge and Cutler's Brigade of Wadsworth's division of the 1st Corps on the south slope. This movement apparently caused Cutler to pull his men back to a more protected position in Sheeds' woods. As the two regiments continued forward, they were hit by a crossfire from Cutler's troops in the front and Stone's brigade on their right. Colonel William Owens, commander of the 53rd North Carolina, halted his men when the Alabamians on his left suddenly stopped and fell back. Without support on the right or left, Owens also ordered his men to fall back about 50 yards to reconnect with the 3rd Alabama. The men had not settled down long when the 3rd Alabama again moved, this time to form on the right flank of Ramser's brigade, as he did not receive orders from General Daniel. So my point with that is there's all this moving around. There's all this, oh, wait, those guys fell back. Well, now we got to go back and connect with them. Oh, no, we just got here, and now they're going back into a different position. And, and we got to link up with them and follow them. And this is all while there's gunfire going on and, you know, other people are maneuvering and yep. it's a mess. Yeah. And, and Daniels really doesn't know anything about the 12th North Carolina Carolinians. Um, he's never given instructions. Hey, we're going to give you this regiment to support y'all. He, so he's. Wait, which was the 12th? The, the part of uh, O'Neill's. O'Neill's. They okay. get switched over there. No, oh, I'm sorry, the third. The third Alabama. The third Alabama. Yeah, right, yeah, not I'm 12th sorry. North Carolina. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. um, the third Alabama. And so they're, they want to go with Daniel. Daniel says, I don't have any orders for you. It's only when Ramsier comes forward that they cooperate more fully with Ramsier's brigade um, in a more organized fashion. It is very disorganized. Um no, but wait, Ramser's brigade though, that's coming in as like a second wave. Yeah. Is that right? Like so he was it's, what a reserve brigade. They were at the first re- reserve. Um, yeah. and then they're coming in behind um Daniels and Iverson. Right. Okay. Brigade. Yeah. Okay. Um and that's finally when the third Alabama gets instruction or they, they say, Yeah, you can come with us and operate under us. Um it's very chaotic. Um I I can it's easy for me to sit here and nobody's shooting at me, but it, this is on roads. I mean, Mm -hmm. later in the war, Rhodes has this great reputation of being a great divisional commander. It's not made at Gettysburg. No. Gettysburg is a low point for him as far as division command, of course. Um, So it's just the way he initially sets everything up. um, Is he one of the ones that's new to division command? Yes. Yeah, Yeah. he is, right. He moved up. And later on, he is. He's pretty pretty good divisional commander, and then he gets killed in 1864. um, Winchester, I believe. Um, Mm Yeah. So he does well later on after this. Um, like many of Lee's men, or commanders, I should say, this, is, this isn't his best effort right. when he's here. Yeah. So it just, they have bad days at the worst possible moment to have bad days. <laughs> um, so, but again, a couple of uh, Daniel's regiments are going up against Cutler, and he falls back to Sheets Woods. The rest of his brigade, it's two regiments and a battalion. Now... For the uh, uh, uninitiated in military parlance, a battalion is smaller than a regiment. It's about half a regiment. Um, There are still regiments around in the Army. Um, My last tour of duty was field artillery. I was in a battalion within a regiment. So they're there. Um, So a battalion is basically... As you're building the army, you know, you start with your company and then you're moving up. And so a few, Generally, three battalions go into a regiment. Right. So yeah. it's a, a third. It's a third. It's not a half. Yeah, it's yeah, a yeah. third of the yeah. regiment. I and, did well in math. Uh, and in the cavalry, they call them squadrons, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it's uh, what? Two to three companies is how would you, uh, I guess it would be like around three companies. Because if you're doing it in thirds and you have 10 companies, then yeah, yeah, essentially. Yeah. yeah. And it depends on what type of, you know, in, in, in field artillery, we had sections. We had either six or eight mm-hmm. sections mm-hmm. and then um, a separate fire directional section made up the battalion. This, and, is, this is in modern. Yeah, modern. Yeah. Um, and that's how I, I try to equate the things and put up. Um, not to confuse people. We'll just say that. Well, it confused me. Uh, well, I'll try not to. <laughs> 
Um, it's because it's cold in here. <laughs> I know. Um, <laughs> battalions are smaller than regiments. You don't see too many battalions operating here at Gettysburg. No, but so I always wondered that because their official name is, you know, the whatever, whatever state battalion, mm-hmm. right? Like, what's the one that we're dealing with here? It's the second? Second North Carolina Second Italian. North Carolina yep. Battalion. It's got about 250 men in it. <clears throat> so, but my question is, like, when they were formed, was it that they were only able to raise enough men to form what would be a battalion, so they call themselves battalion, or is it just kind of like they think it sounds cool? Like, why would they use that instead um, of regiment? Probably the former, and I, I wouldn't think it was the latter. Uh, so it, was, it has nothing to do with how they sound. Um, <laughs> so... So it's it's about um, uh, just just you know instead of coming up with a thousand men, they came up with three hundred. Yeah, thereabouts. Yeah, basically, so they're okay. okay, and they want to keep their identity. Um, okay, so that's why you have this battalion within this brigade. So two regiments in that that battalion are headed southwest, and they're headed towards the railroad bed. There are three railroad cuts within the railroad bed. We the most famous one that we talk about, and a road goes over it, is the middle cut. That's what Rufus right. Dawes charges into um, early in the day on July first and captures all the men from Mississippi. But on either side of that cut, to the east, there's another cut, mm-hmm. and it's you know surrounded by woods. It's behind or or to the I guess that would be north um, of Lee's headquarters. Yeah, those woods back there. There's a cut there, right? And then if you go to the other end of the line, in the area of um, across the the Chambersburg Pike from the um, like West Kalis End Battery, the West End Guide Station, yeah, that area, yeah. all that area, there's another cut. And it's just surrounded by trees and stuff, so you right. don't realize it. But that's the other cut. That's the West End cut, and that's where Daniel's uh, two other two brigades in this battalion are headed towards, and facing them are primarily it's the 149th Pennsylvania. And Roy Stone's brigade, and then to their right, coming towards the south, is the 143rd, and then back behind them, facing northwest, is the 150th, and part of them are going to or turn and face um, this threat from Daniel's brigade, also. Okay, so you've got these 143rd, 149th, 150th Pennsylvania facing on the other side of the Chambersburg Pike. Junius Daniels Brigade that's coming towards them. And so, and, and Daniels Brigade, though, he's got, like you're pointing out, uh, and if people aren't, well, you know, if you don't have all these locations like firmly implanted in your brain or come and, on the tour. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> you got to come to Gettysburg. Um, but also, uh, the um, uh, 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 if you're not looking at one of the uh, map books like Godfrey's Maps or the Lano Map Book, um, just imagine you're in a brigade, you are a brigade, and you're moving forward across a field, and your uh, main objective is straight ahead of you, but over to your left in the woods is another is a Union brigade that you have to be careful of and you have to be aware of, right? But And that's Cutler's brigade. But he's, is, when, when Daniels goes over to attack the, the cut, um, does he does he have to send some troops over to uh, occupy Cutler, or is there another brigade from Rhodes' division coming up through the woods? No, there's not. It's that's where the other two brigades that it come down. It's the um, the, well, the two it's regiments. 50, 50, yeah, reg, regiments. Yeah, fifty third North Carolina goes over there. 50, okay. Yeah, fifty third goes over there. Um, it pushes them back. The other problem they're facing is artillery. You have a battery near. Lee's headquarters, that area. Stewart's. Stewart's battery, yep. Um, and then across the road is, Reynolds. I think it's Reynolds battery. Yeah. They're firing at Daniel's men as they're coming across, too. Right. So they are taking um, artillery fire. And then they got this railroad cut in front of them. And then there's a, a gap of space. And then there's the Chambersburg Pike. Right. So it's almost like who can get to the railroad cut first? Um, yeah, because Stone's men are trying to get over there, too. Yeah. Or they're over there. Yeah, well, they, they move up to... Um, the rim. They move up to the Chambersburg Pike first, uh-huh. and then the 149th Pennsylvania is going to cross the pike. They're going to come to the cut also. Now, the, the cut's only going to do you so much good anyways, as the men from Mississippi earlier today found out, because when you're down in there, if you're in the deepest part of it... You're not getting out. You can only look up. Yeah. Um, and so you're not... You're not 
It seems like it's like a repeat of the morning now because these guys are learning the same thing that the Mississippi boys learned. Yes. The hard um, way. Although they react, I think, a little bit faster. So you don't have 200 men from North Carolina getting captured and, right. and blunting it. It's the North Carolinians that are going to eventually push the Pennsylvanians out of there. Because Daniels wins the day eventually. Right. Because some Pennsylvanians don't even get out of the, no, no, no. the cut. Yeah. 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 Um, so, but that's what he's faced with. And they, they're going up against these three regiments from Stone's Brigade. Um, and they had the big fight there. And again, uh, eventually they're going to push them back. While this is going on, you have stuff going on, on the other side of the Chambersburg Pike. You mm. have Brock and Bros Brigade comes through. You, know, you have these. Right. So, Cruz division is coming down. So he, um, yeah, right. So there. So this is after the the afternoon lull or the noon, the midday lull. Yes. Um. It, it's it's Pettigrew's. Uh, I'm sorry. Um. What you just said his name? No, 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 no. The division commander Pender. Pender. Yeah, yeah I said P- Pettigrew. I, I misspoke. Pender. But, okay, but uh, see, I missed that. <laughs> uh, it's Pender's division now is going to resume the attack in the area where Heath's division attacked in the morning. Yes. Right and um. And Daniel is going to see this, Brock and Brow's Brigade specifically, and so and, and they're moving from the west to the east, essentially. Yeah. And now Daniel is going to from move from the north to the south to kind of collapse in on uh, Stone's Brigade. Is that essentially what's... Yeah. What, okay. yeah, he's trying to work in conjunction with, with Brock and Brow. Right. Um, and they're going to try to swallow up yes. the Pennsylvanians. Um, How does that work out? Uh, for Brockenboro, no, not too well. Um, <laughs> Why not? They just suffer a lot. The 150th is there. Again, they're facing two different directions, mm-hmm. um, and they just get tore up. There's artillery back on um, Seminary Ridge that we talked about again last year, too, um, just tearing into them. So Brockenboro is going to get – they make some progress, but they get stalled, and then Scales Brigade is going to come behind them. They're just going to get slaughtered out there in that field. That's – a lot of people don't talk about that. Uh, of all the the Confederate brigades that just get slaughtered. I don't know what other word to use. Right. They get rendered ineffective. Yeah. Not, not a lot of people mention Scales Brigade. You don't hear about them after the first because they lose so many men out there in that field. In between the where the modern-day Seminary Road is, looking towards the McPherson barn, that area is just— Death is they're decimated in that area. So you have the, those Confederate brigades come in on the south side of the Chambersburg Pike, and it's with those to to more or lesser extent that Daniels is trying to cooperate with and knock these Pennsylvanians, these three regiments I previously mentioned, back also and push everything south. Eventually okay. they're going to do it. Eventually the other side of the roads, the Confederates are going to do it also, uh, and then everything goes through the town and back to the hill. So, so uh, then uh, the Confederates are going to uh, succeed in pushing the Union troops uh, not only off of McPherson's Ridge and Seminary Ridge, but uh, all the way the through town. the town. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We know that. And uh, Daniel's Brigade, uh, what do they do? Are they, do they give pursuit or do they chillax? They they stop right around Seminary Ridge. They don't go into the town. They're not okay. one of the brigades that chases them into town. They stop. Once Seminary Ridge, and they're gathering up wounded and trying to get their own act together, um, getting people to the aid station and field hospital, et cetera. Um, and then they're going to get ready for the next day that they assume is going to be more of the same that happened on the first day. Do they have a little bit of uh, an issue with water? Well, they need water. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, what, what little water source there is up here is, you know, it's probably been contaminated by this point with all the dead bodies floating around and stuff. Yeah. Um, I don't know what unit doesn't have an issue with water. Yeah. Well, it's a private James Green of the 53rd North Carolina said, it was a very hot day and our men suffered very much for water for they were marched in quick time for several miles before they got to the battlefield and did not have a chance of getting water in their canteens. So they donned meaning don't, or done, oh, done. That's what he's doing. <laughs> so they done without um, from 10 in the morning until 5 p.m. That is a long time to be out in the heat and on top of that, exert yourself Yes. and go without water. Yeah. 
Um, that's why 20 year olds fight wars, ladies and gentlemen, not 44 year old fat guys with no hair like myself. <laughs> <laughs> Either that or you just make sure you bring a lot of water with you. <laughs> right. So, But I know I know enough to know that you can't always rely on being able to have a lot of water. There isn't a 7-Eleven on the corner of every battlefield where I can just go in and grab a bottle of uh, that Hawaiian volcano water I love. Hmm. But anyway. That, did that give you superpower or something? I feel like it does. Yeah. It tastes like rocks. And that's what I like about it. I feel like I'm actually getting minerals in me. All right. Because it's volcanic and uh, it tastes like rock. Have you ever, you know what I'm talking about? I have no idea. I don't know how to pronounce <laughs> it. It's a Hawaiian word. It's like waiakiai or something. <laughs> it's a lot of vowels, but it's uh, delicious water. I wonder if the Brady family drank that when they went to Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It would have brought them better luck <laughs> if he didn't wear that stupid talisman on his, uh, around met, his neck. He ended up met, meeting Vincent Price. <laughs> yeah. Well, and yeah. Oliver. <laughs> <laughs> cousin Oliver. You, you would have thought no, this they... wasn't the cousin. This is the, the statue that Vincent Price talked to in the cave with oh, Nate Oliver. Oh, I don't remember that. Oh, yeah. I just remember the big spider. Remember the spider? Yeah, yeah. yeah I didn't like that. I don't like and spiders. And then Greg gets conked on the head when he's doing the surfing contest. Yes, yes. Alice throws her back out. <laughs> <laughs> I know too much stuff. I used to love that show. Yeah, oh, well, me too. That, that's actually... And that's a classic the, episode. It's, it's three episodes. That's uh, right. Yeah, it was, it was like it was. several yeah. in a row, right? Yeah. yeah. The Bradys go to Hawaii. Yeah. Hmm. They went everywhere. Went to the Grand Canyon. I remember that one. They went to the amusement park, Kings Island in Ohio. I don't remember that one. Yeah, because uh, uh, Mr. Brady had plans to develop something, and that's where they were going to go. I was a big fan of the Brady Bunch movies. Remember the Brady Bunch movies? I was out by then. Oh, they were in the 90s. Yeah, I considered myself an adult at that point. Yeah, but, uh, yeah I, was <laughs> I was a teenager. Out, yeah. But uh, I've recently watched them again. They're very funny. They're very well done because yeah. they, they really capture the goofiness of yeah. the Brady family. Because they, they the put them in the 90s. Yeah. It's like 70s Brady, yeah. but in the 90s. Yeah. So fish out of water thing. And it's, you know. But, you know, Davy Jones is on it. Uh, Who don't like Davy Jones? And they go to Hawaii in the yeah. second one, you know. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's good. It's good. Anyway, the people are like, what the hell is wrong with these guys? <laughs> so, okay. It's been a long day. Already. <laughs> day one. Yeah, I know. Oh, that's another story. We, we lost, uh, my key to the studio broke off in the lock and we couldn't get it. Uh, we didn't have a, you know, a pair of pliers or anything to at least, you know, open the lock. Um, and we had to like. Well, I don't want to tell you what we had to do to get in here, but it was a real pain. We in the took butt. some road trips. We took some road trips yeah. to try to find a spare key, but everybody I gave a spare key to is not around. And uh, the one person who was around couldn't remember where he put it. We went <laughs> looking all over the place. It was a mess. But anyway, we got in, and here we are. <laughs> the so, dedication okay. of this show. <laughs> I know. I know. Yeah, exactly. This is how much I love you, folks. Lewis came all the way up from Virginia, and uh, we. You know, we risked getting caught for uh, being burglars, you know, if somebody saw us trying to get into the shed, um, just so that we could do this show for you guys. So don't forget, patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg and reward that dedication. Okay, so. That's right. Now, the day's over for Daniel's Brigade. Yep. Where, where do they get uh, assigned by the time they rest their weary heads for bed? Their next place of duty is going to be, you know, it's moving into day two. Rhodes Division is going to be moved down to Long Lane. Um, so it's not modern-day Long Lane, because Long Lane is – there's two different Long Lanes. Right. So it's – if you look on a map of Gettysburg in 1863, it's that Long Lane. And what they're instructed to do – Which Rhodes, isn't so off from no, this Long no, Lane. No. The Long Lane – Today is partially on the yes, bed yes, of old yes. Long Lane, but yeah. then it diverges yeah. from that. It takes uh, a ninety degree turn out to the Emmitsburg Road. Yeah, um, but they're there to offer support um, as the attack, the Confederate attack on the July second moves up the line, going north. Starts off with Hood's division, of course, and it rolls northward as it's doing that, and then Ewell's division or, or corps is assigned to attack Culp's Hill. And East Cemetery Hill, Rhodes' division is supposed to exploit any weakness and attack Cemetery Hill from the northeast. And so his divisions moved up. They're in two lines. Um, Daniel and O'Neill are on the second line. Ramsier, Iverson, and Doles are in the first line. Ramsier's sort of put in charge of that first line. 
and then Daniels is given command over O'Neill's brigade along with his in that second line. Mm. For a variety of reasons, all of them probably good, they don't attack. Rhodes' division doesn't move. And I say it's probably good because they would have gotten slaughtered. They would have been coming across open ground. Even though it's night, there's so many cannon up there staring down Mm -hmm. at them. They didn't stand a chance. So they don't attack. Um, There are people on the other side of that hill, Confederates, that are grumbling about that. They thought Rhodes was supposed to operate with this. But um, I, I think as bad a day Rhodes has on the first day, for whatever reasons, they don't attack on that second day. That's probably a prudent decision. That's unnecessary waste of manpower that yeah. they can't afford to lose at right. this point. Right. So the the plan goes out of whack before this anyways. So it's the the reason they fail on J second has nothing to do with roads really. So but that's where they're at. So their long lane is where they're assigned. Long lane. And w- one thing uh that I just uh, realized today is that for a while Rhodes placed O'Neill's brigade under Daniel's command. Yep. Um now O'Neill's what, a lieutenant colonel? Or is no, it he's a, a colonel. colonel. He's a full colonel. He's waiting to get his star. Aha. Uh-huh. But and so he's in command of the brigade, which is not abnormal to have a colonel in command of a, of a brigade. Nope. Uh, but uh, Rhodes is not uh, particularly trust uh, trusting uh, in no, him. Or again, much on the first him? day, he he really doesn't take charge of his brigade, and that's Rhodes' old brigade. So there's a certain you know affiliation and attachment to his old brigade. Right. He loves that brigade. Yeah. And. Uh, you know, part of it's Rhodes' problem, though. He, he sort of he micromanages that brigade on the first day. He doesn't let O'Neill do what O'Neill's being paid to do. Um, uh. And, he, you know, he pulls one regiment back to be a reserve, and he sends the other one over to the right of Iverson, like we, we previously spoke of. Um, but even so, O'Neill sort of hangs back, and afterwards he says, I thought Rhodes was in charge of, you know, paraphrasing. I thought Rhodes was in charge of everything. He clearly doesn't lead that brigade. So there's a lack of confidence at this point um, about O'Neill from Rhodes. What do you think is the major malfunction in Rhodes' division? Is it him or like what's with all the leaders? Well, we talked about Iverson. That's what I think is he's gun shy. I think that's his problem. Yeah, that makes Um, sense. And there's a lot of controversy on, you know, they don't like Iverson, um, that Brigade. They don't care for, for Iverson. In O'Neill, um, there's probably a want of confidence there. O'Neill doesn't do anything really to justify, you know, to warrant any confidence, I would say. Um, although Lee has his promotion in his pocket here at Gettysburg, his pr- promotion to Brigadier General. After his performance here at Gettysburg, he doesn't get promoted. Uh-huh. So, because... Yeah. He has a poor performance. It's that now, how poor. do we how do we know that? Are you saying are you being figurative that he had his promotion in his pocket, or did he actually he had, have, had it with him? Yeah, okay. We say well, in his pocket, right? I, yeah, with. Him. I understand yeah. that. Yeah, so he actually had promotion papers for yeah, him. Yeah, it's been approved by the Confederate Congress and uh-huh. all that because it's 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 not one of these. He's going from lieutenant to captain. Things. Right, it's the general. Yeah. Well, wait, so but um, so how do we all, know that? Did, did Lee say that? How do we, who told us the that? The correspondence afterwards when Lee says, "I'm not going to promote this." guy. Guy. Oh, gotcha. Um, yeah, it's out. It's you can find the the correspondence. Some of that's in the official record. It says um, it is not God's will that I promote this man. <laughs> He's not a very good actor. <laughs> an actor? <laughs> we move on the word of an actor. <laughs> so uh, but that's uh, that's probably why Rhodes is putting Daniels in charge. And in the front line, it's Ramsier. Do, um, Rhodes gives Ramsier the. The authority over that front line, the other his brigade, along with the other two, one of which is Iverson, clearly had some problems. But the other one is George Dole. George Dole's brigade is a very underrated brigade here at Gettysburg. Now we did is it two years ago or three? No, I think it was two. We did a a, a um, get out of the car tour in that area. I did that tour more from the Union perspective, though. So if we're going to classify the tour, it was a Union tour. People, you know, I know you tell me people get upset. You don't do enough Confederate stuff. (laughs) Well, if you pay attention, I actually do. (laughs) I got Robert E. Lee car tags. What more do you want from me? Um, (laughs) Right. (laughs) um, But we did it from, we did it more from um, 
the Union side, but it was George Stoll's brigade coming down and attacking um, Schemmel Fenning's line, Schemmel Fenning's brigade there. Oh, yeah. Um, that might have been three years ago. Time. I feel like that was a, a, an early tour. It was. Like early in the year. And we walked all the way up to the McLean farm. Because remember, we went there the week before. And it rained and it was, on us. Yeah, it was yeah. raining. It was wet. Yeah. And I feel like that was like the mm, April, maybe May, but I think it was an April tour. And it was it was pretty warm the day we did the tour. I remember yeah. that. The week before it was oh, kind of chilly and wet. The day we did the tour it was a gorgeous I remember day. Sweating, but yeah, that's nothing. I'd rather sweat than freeze. Oh, yeah, me too. Yeah, I me hate too. Being cold. But um, yeah, well, okay. Well, regardless of what year that was, but Doles is um, it very underrated. Uh, not enough people really talk about Doles and his performance here. He does yeah. a good job, but he's on that front line too. Um, but it's Ramsier that looks up and says, you know, we got all these cannons staring at us. This is suicide. We can't do it. And so they don't attack. Um, so then we roll to the third day and Yule is going to attack Culp's Hill again. And this is part of Lee's original plan for the third day. He wants to attack on the flanks you know, because they've made some gains, which they have, but, mm-hmm. it's, you know, mm-hmm. hindsight being 2020, mm-hmm. it's not going to get you anywhere anything mm-hmm. on the third day either. But part of that original uh, third day plan before it becomes what we know as Pickett's Charge um, is to attack also on Culp's Hill again. And for that, they're going to move part of Rhodes' division around to Culp's Hill. And that's going to be Junius Daniels Brigade along with O'Neill. So they are going to take part in the July 3rd attack on Culp's Hill on the morning of um, July 3rd. so Right, so they go over and are attached to Yule. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, so how does it go for them over in Culp's Hill? They're, what, Daniels is uh, put between, or behind Jones, Behind right? Jones, so who's Jones is on the right. Of yeah, he's on the Yule's right. Next to him is Johnson. Uh, Jesse Williams' Louisiana Brigade. And then behind Jones is Daniels. Behind Williams is O'Neill. So O'Neill is, if you're facing Culp Hill from the Confederate perspective, Daniels is on the right. On his left is O'Neill. Right, okay. In front of Daniels is Jones. To the left of Jones is Williams, Louisiana Brigade. And they have, because uh, Jones, uh, if you go by his brigade marker at least, you know, the, the guys on the right, they have, that part of the hill is... They write that you need scaling ladders, and that's the term they use. And if you ever go stand, um, walk down from the 66th Ohio Monument, you can get to a ledge, and it looks like a little cliff. It's a miniature cliff. Yeah. There's no way you're getting up that Well, and if you go around the northern face of it, um, where the Iron Brigade was, where their earthworks are and everything like that, there's that one part. Well, it's actually close to the 7th Indiana um. Yeah. Right. Right. Where their monument is, it's just like a straight drop down. Yeah, you're not getting up there. No. So, but it does. If you come south, it does sort of level out some. It does. Um, and then it goes up a little bit more because you're getting to the lower portion of the hill. It's very uneven, and it's impossible. So, what do yeah. they do? So, Doles can't. I mean, he can, but he's not going to get very far going Daniels. straight ahead. No, Dole. I'm sorry, Jones. Jones. <laughs> We're both wrong. (laughs) Jones. I was at least on the right part of the field. (laughs) (laughs) Jones can't go straight ahead to like where the 66th Ohio monument is, right? Is that is that 66th Ohio? Yeah, they were. He's not going to go there, is he? No, he's going to go further south. Further south, like you'd have to. Yeah, I mean, maybe maybe keep a force there to hold on to the Union troops in that area. What happens is the 66th Ohio swings out and starts firing into their flank. Oh, that's right. That was another tour. That's right. I forgot about that. That, Yeah, that that was has one of my favorite letters from a soldier. He wrote back home. He's with the 66th Ohio, and the letter gets published in a newspaper. It's written on maybe the fifth or sixth. He's like. It's right after, maybe it was written on the 4th, because it's right after Pickett's Charge. Like, Longstreet's dead, A.P. Hill's been captured, Lee's lost an arm. or so. It's all kinds of crazy yeah. stuff that we know now. Yeah. But that, it's fun for me to read, because I was a soldier once, and I used to, you know, when I was a private, I lived off rumors. Mm-hmm. And that's the thing that, oh, yeah, we're going <laughs> home soon. I can't wait. Oh, yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> so uh, it's just a fun letter to read, but... 66 Ohio swings out and ends up firing to their flank. Right. Um, which 
you know, I, I don't know what people visit on the field. I know where I take them. But I wonder if that story gets told a lot for the average visitor going up there to see that monument. I mean, unless you had a guide going with you to... You need a uh, guide. <laughs> yeah, you do. Uh, to, to decipher all this stuff for you. You know, a lot of this stuff is like, is like it's like the Da Vinci Code. You know, there's there, it's hidden in plain sight, but certain things mean things. Whether it's the core badges on the monuments or the state seals on the monuments, yeah, and yep, yep. you know, um, or the shape of the brigade plaque uh, bases, uh, you know, like just the, these little things. Like there's a there's kind of a code, yeah. Some intentional, yeah. some not, like the the hooves. But uh, you do need a guide. I always tell people there's you know 1,400 markers and monuments and memorials here. Um, good luck trying to read them and figure out what the hell they're talking about. And, you know, it's it's a very well-marked battlefield, but that makes it more confusing. And uh, I, I can't speak for other guides because, you know, we all have our, our different likes and dislikes. But once you get the basic story down, I love giving tours on a specific spot on the field. Yeah. It, you know— the, to me, giving a tour, a first-time visitor out here, the, the two- or three-hour general narrative, that's great because it's, it's an honor to show somebody this field for the first time. Mm -hmm. It really is, and I tell them that. It's my honor. Um, but once you get that down, to go to a particular spot and talk about the 66 Ohio swinging out there, because you're not going to hear that in a three-hour general tour. No. You're not going to get anywhere You're not going to get near it. No. Um, but that's so much fun. And I, I imagine other guides feel the same. It's it's good to get off the beaten path and do something different. Well, I noticed that. that a lot of uh, our listeners that contact me and they ask, you know, can I take a tour with Lewis or Charlie or Bob or whatever? And I set them up uh, with them. Um, they are with you guys, I guess I should say. Um, they often want to do a specific part of the field. They don't want to do a general tour. Yeah. They, they want to do Culp's Hill or they want to do whatever, the angle or, you know, whatever. Um, and uh, I think that's good. I mean, obviously, if you've never been here, if you're new to this, do the overviews several times. I, and that's the other thing, too, is a lot of people think that the guides all operate off of the same script, but there is no script. Everybody comes up with their own way of doing things. So you can take an overview tour with Lewis, and then when you come next year, you take one with Charlie Fennell, and then that following year, you take one with Bob Steenstra, and you're going to get three different perspectives. None of them are more right or wrong than the others. There's just different ways of, yep. of looking at things, and of course, they, they find different aspects of the battle more interesting um, than, you know, than someone else might. And so they're going to focus more on that type of stuff. You just can never learn it all with one visit and um, you got to keep doing it. And then after you do like three with three different guides or even the same guide, because some people really like a guide and they want to go again and again, whatever, you do three of them, general overview, and then start getting into the nitty gritty of things as you, as you learn more and find things that interest you. Yeah. And I, I think that's a good way to do it. Uh, but everybody learns in a different way. If anyway. you're ever here, just people are here and they see guides, guides don't all stop at the same places. Right. So if you're going to a different place, you got to tell a different story from that place. Yeah. You know, because something else happened there. That's right. And uh, you're right. There, no two stories are the same. We don't go on tours with each other, so we don't, you know. Right. Right. I don't know what any other guys talking about when I'm out there. I the mean, general, you might talk shop once in a while yeah, yeah, and be the, like, what the, do you do at this part? The you know, general but, story remains the same. Yes. Um, I like to change the outcome every once in a while. I don't. <laughs> I just leave it to people to figure out when I do that. Um, that's a lie. I just No, you can't do um, that. So the general story remains the same, but the specifics that we tell are probably different depending on where we stop, the type of tour they want, where they're from. Because if they're from mm -hmm. Minnesota, we're going to stop at the first sure. Minnesota, um, sure. something like that. So, but yeah, um, back to the the matter at hand. Yes, that area of Culp's Hill, people really don't go there, but it is Jones Brigade, and then Daniels behind them. They were trying to earn their money that day to get up that hill. I mean, that's the hill, and then you're facing, you know, Green's Brigade has spent the previous day. Digging the trench, the entrenching there, right? The breastworks. Um, so it's not like you're going up a hill and it's going to open up for you where there's easily identifiable enemy up there. We can kill them easy. No, they're behind protection, and you're coming uphill. 
Mm-hmm. So, and then they're rotating regiments out of those breastworks. So you got fresher men filling that. And there's after Daniels, there's nobody coming in behind them. Right. You got what you got. Yeah. So, so uh, how does the fighting go for them on Cult Not Cell? very well. No. They what get repulsed. Uh-huh. Um, and that's part of around 4 30 in the morning on July 3rd, Union Artillery is going to open up on Culp's Hill, you know, targeting. Culp's Hill. They're targeting those Confederates that have occupied the breastworks that were vacated the night before when a lot of those troops get pulled out, the majority get pulled out and sent to try and rescue the left um, end of the Union line when Sickles line breaks, etc. So about 4.30 in the morning, Union's going to open their attack with artillery and they're going to spend um, about seven hours and they are going to drive the Confederates off of Culp's Hill, the length of the hill. That's the longest continuous fighting of any of the three days at Gettysburg. Yeah. It barely gets talked about. I know. That's because what's so of crazy. what happens in the afternoon. Um, and that's, that's a more visible thing that happens in the afternoon. People see it, and they think it's magnificent just on the visual effects alone. Yeah. But the fighting over here on Culp's Hill is you know, just as important. It's the right flank of the Union Army sure. that the Union, uh, the Confederates are trying to break. And what are what is the Union protecting? They're protecting their lifeline, yeah. the Baltimore Pike, which heads down to Georgia Avenue um, in D.C. So one might argue the right flank is more important than the left flank, even though there's no beautiful view. I would argue that, too. I would, too. Yeah. Um, again, when you don't have visuals... Visuals make it. Visuals, yeah. In a lot of things. People want to see stuff. Sure. Especially today. Yeah. Nobody reads. Who oh, reads? No, no. Nobody knows reads how to read. Suckers. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but it, they spend a lot of time. Uh, Daniel's Brigade, you know, it's it's an exercise in futility. They're trying to attack that upper portion of the hill. Um, mm-hmm. Stewart's Brigade is down toward the left. That's the Maryland, where the Marylanders yep. occupied the trenches. We had a tour there, too. Um after all this expenditure of energy and men, they're going to be repulsed. And that's, you know, after what happens in the afternoon, then we have Farnsworth's charge and all that. That's going to end the Battle of Gettysburg. So let me give you a little uh, thing here. This is, by the way, I've been reading from the Brigades. Uh, what is it? Brigades of Gettysburg. I always get it confused. By Outstanding Bradley. book. It is. It's very handy to have, especially for me when, uh, you know, we're doing a show on, uh, you know, such and such brigade. It's like, oh, well, I don't need to go far to find out a little little refresher. Before you know. I became a guide, that was one of the first, after I got the, the general knowledge books down, mm-hmm. and I said, I, I'd like to be a guide, and I need to get in-depth. That was one of the first books I bought. I wonder, you know, I haven't read it cover to cover. I usually just use it as a reference. But I wonder if I read it to cover to cover, if if th- if it's a different way of learning the story of the battle. Because you're getting each brigade. It's so, tedious. I've done it. Well, you have? Yeah. It's yeah. just tedious. I would imagine it is. Any kind of learning is usually tedious. So, but, <laughs> but anyway. Well, there's no... There's no linear aspect to it. Right. So no, it's, it's just, it makes it tedious. So no, you, no, you would have to be like, you read about something that somebody did on the morning of July 1st, and then several brigades later, you're reading about maybe the counterpart or yeah, it's a whole uh, lot a of cohort. jumping around yeah, or, without yeah. jumping around. Right. Yeah. Uh, all right. But so let's see here. Uh, the federal artillery. Okay. So by the way, at this point, Daniel is also uh, not directly responsible for O'Neill's brigade anymore. Um, and then uh, the Federal Artillery opened during its march to its position behind Jones's brigade, causing several casualties in the 32nd North Carolina. Colonel Brabble bitterly wrote after the battle that his regiment, quote, uh, or his regiment lost, quote, many men and doing little injury to the enemy. A feeling of dread filled General Daniel as daybreak apo- approached. Quote, the hill in front of this position was, in my opinion, so strong that it could not have been carried by any force, he wrote in his report. After waiting several hours, Daniel received orders to file to the left, where his brigade was to storm the heights uh, in conjunction with Stewart's brigade. The men were exposed during this movement, and federal shells rained down on them, killing and wounding as many as a 100. 
Sergeant Albert Marsh of the 53rd North Carolina wrote after the war that being in an open ground for about a half a mile, it is a wonder that our loss was not greater. Both generals Daniel and Stuart protested the order to charge the hill, but their pleas fell on death on deaf ears. Daniel dejectedly returned to his command, now facing the lower hill. To his left was Stuart's brigade. The Stonewall Brigade was on his right. The brigade was formed into two lines. The 43rd North Carolina formed the left of the first line with its left flank at right angles with the 3rd North Carolina of Stuart. Brigade. To the right of the 43rd was the 45th North Carolina, and then the 2nd North Carolina Battalion. In the second line, the 32nd North Carolina formed behind the 43rd North Carolina, and the 53rd North Carolina was behind the 45th North Carolina. Against them were Candy and Kane of the 12th Corps Gears Division, occupying strong breastworks. So they had... uh, they had uh, their work cut out for them. And this is a guy who, uh, on the first, we've already discussed it, was out front leading his brigade. So this is not uh, a, a man afraid to fight telling right. them we shouldn't do this charge. He's afraid to slaughter his men. Yeah. Yeah. And it's against good common sense. So. And then the other thing, you, yeah. you mentioned that they're coming through the open field and they're getting hit by shells. That's the other disadvantage the Confederates have. There is no artillery support for them. Right. So. Because Benner's Hill would be the only place they could put it, and we already know from the day before yeah. that that is not a uh, what do you call it? A, a, a it's not sustainable a position. No. Yeah. Uh. So um, so yeah, that's a, that's the other thing. They're getting hammered with yeah. uh, artillery, and, and it, it doesn't take much if you don't have any artillery coming back at no. you, right? No. Because what are they? Probably just that one battery. Who's who's firing on? Them? Oh no, because you got, uh, you got Powers, Powers Hill, Hill, and then you got. Um, Guns up and down the Baltimore Pike. Yeah, see, th- this is the thing. It's easy to forget that because you can't see that stuff now. There's too many trees. Yeah. People think that we uh, we destroy our forests and stuff, but we have more trees now than they did back then. Yeah, it's, you know, I we don't all use the wood like it's, they it's used the to. It's the weird thing. You get the, you get the better sight lines in the wintertime. Yeah, because it's the closest to yeah. not having the trees that... It's just freezing. Yeah, that's the problem. So everything else looks different, but the sight lines are great. And yeah. Your toes are about to fall And off. if there's a little snow on the ground, it provides a nice contrast. So it's easy for you to say, oh, that's Powers Hill. Yeah. You can because see how- you can see the white yeah. of the snow. Yeah. Uh, all right. So the, the battle ends. Daniel's Brigade loses, what, 900-something men? About 46, 47 percent. Yeah. And that's... Out of 2,000. Yeah. I mean, basically half. Close, yep. It's a lot. It is a lot. And uh, um, what what do they do? Uh, they, I mean, Daniel's brigade makes it all the way to Appomattox. Is Daniel still in command at Appomattox? No. What happens to him? Daniel's dies. Oh. He gets killed down in the mule shoe. Oh. It's Pennsylvania. Okay. Um, but he makes it that far. He makes it, you know, a little less than a year later. Uh-huh. A lot of people get killed down there in the mule shoe. Sure. In that, sure. That, that overland campaign and stuff. Just um, another battle fought over shoes. Mule shoes at that. Uh, <laughs> they love, fights over horseshoes. The Civil War people loved shoes. <laughs> Didn't matter if they were for mules or for men. They love shoes, railroad cuts, bloody mm. runs, bloody lanes. Bloody angles. Angles. Peach orchards. Peach orchards. Who doesn't love fruit? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yum. So, yeah, he, he gets killed. Um, they leave here. The night of July 4th going into the 5th, Rhodes Division ends up being the rear guard for Lee's army. So the first um, Union force of any numbers to speak of is the 6th Corps are going to take off out of here. Hmm. I won't use the word chase. Um, they're not going fast enough to actually chase anybody, um, but they are following on their, they're on their heels. And so there's skirmishing going back and forth. Um not any real big fights other than there is a, a fight in Fairfield. Um, Daniel's brigade is going to go through Fairfield. They're going to head to Hagerstown, Maryland. I think they they arrive there around the 7th of July. Okay. And they're going to spend three or four days there. And then they're going to head down to the Potomac River. They're going to cross the river on the night of the 13th and then head down back into Virginia, the Shenandoah Valley. Mm. So, and then the campaign, of course, and thus ends the campaign. Comes comes to an end on the fourteenth. 
All right. And so what we're going to do now is take our break and come back with uh, questions submitted by our patrons over at patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg. That's how you get to ask questions on Ask a Gettysburg Guide. It's uh, just one of the perks and rewards for your financial support. Um, so uh, why don't you consider being a patron? It's a lot of I'm fun a over there. You are a patron. That's right. And you're on the show. I'm on the show and a patron. You're was, on the show and a patron. patron early on. And you, uh, you're the only one that makes any money off the tours. You get paid uh, as a guide for your tours. And so that's nice. You're giving a little back uh, in your Patreon yeah, uh, nice. pledge. And uh, so you see, and you're like, I think, one of three or four guides that are patrons. Which I'm is, a which patron is, because I believe in the product. There you go. Thank you yeah, very much. That's for, and it's very flattering too to, to see you know guides uh, become patrons. I, one of the <clears throat> I, I generally enjoy ninety nine point nine percent of your episodes have been great. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not talk about the point one because I, I'll get my blood pressure up. I don't like smug people. Uh -huh. Anywho, uh, but when you have guides on, I love listening to what other because I think the other guides are much smarter than I am. I right. love listening. Me too. To what? <laughs> <laughs> but I, I love hearing their thoughts about different things because I don't get to sit. I don't live here. I don't hang out in the visitor center anymore yeah. since the pandemic, so I don't get to hear them talk about. The yeah, Civil you got to move up general. here. You know, if I can get rid of these kids that keep calling me daddy, you know, I, I keep, I, I pick out other people. And say, hey, what about that fellow over there? Doesn't he look like a better daddy than me? Yeah. Keep saying no, I'll keep you. <laughs> All right. You try to so, pass them off yeah, on other yeah. guys. Yeah, it doesn't work that way. I try to get upgrade. And, Most uh, guys don't want the kids that they have, you know. Actually, I love my children. No, of course. Dude. Got all girls, of course. Everybody, you know, the people on the tours. Now, I've got five girls. I have a, uh, the day we're recording this, my third daughter is having a baby shower. She's going to have my fourth really? granddaughter in May. Yeah. Yeah, I keep forgetting you have grandkids. I'm old. Yeah, you are. Yeah, yeah. I got three granddaughters, five daughters. What, you're barely 50 though, right? Or are you over 50? 58. You're 58? Yeah. You're almost 60. I'm closer to 60 now than I am to 58. Wow. Or 57. 50. Yeah. <laughs> I'm closer yeah. to 60 than I am to 57. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wow, I didn't know that. Okay, well, uh, around. I mean, I know you're older than I am, but I thought you were just like, just barely 50. <laughs> don't I wish. Yeah, I My know. knees feel 70. So. Oh, God, don't talk about knees. Yeah, All right, nice. well, look, we'll take a break. We'll come back and we'll talk about other uh, geriatric issues with Lewis uh, right after these words. <laughs> Who can forget the sounds of the 60s? The 1860s. I can't, and you can't either. Now, there's Marching Through Georgia, the exciting new album by Billy Webster. All of your favorite hits of the 1860s in one place. Such hits as Gary Owens. <laughs> the Battle Hymn of the Republic. Quiet along the Potomac tonight. Marching through Georgia. And much, much more. So what are you waiting for? Go to billysongs.com and order your digital download of Billy Webster's Marching Through Georgia today. That's billysongs.com. Seminary Ridge Museum and Education Center, Gettysburg's premier museum, is housed in the historic Lutheran Seminary building constructed in 1832, a witness to the first day of battle. The museum's three floors of exhibits connect visitors to the dilemmas that led to the Civil War, provide a powerful and personal view of the battle's first day, and explore one of the battlefield's largest hospitals. No visit to Seminary Ridge Museum and Education Center is complete without a guided tour of the building's famous cupola, where on the eve of battle, 
battle, officers and civilians saw thousands of Confederate soldiers' campfires burning to the west, and Brigadier General John Buford watched for vital federal reinforcements as fighting erupted on the morning of July 1st. Today, you can stand where Buford stood and discover how this view helped chart the course of the Battle of Gettysburg. Your trip to Gettysburg is not complete without a serious visit to Seminary Ridge Museum and Education Center, Gettysburg's premier museum. Purchase tickets online at seminaryridgemuseum.org or call 717-339-1300. To get tickets or a cupola tour, listeners may call or walk in and mention address in Gettysburg or by ordering online using the promo code AG1863 for 20% off. Seminary Ridge Museum and Education Center. It began here. There's a devil to pay. For the Historian has a wide variety of titles, new and used, of military books from publishers like Osprey, Gettysburg Publishing, Stackpole, Savis Beatty, UNC Press, and more. I make it a point to go there once a week because I have new bookshelves to fill and I never know what treasures I'll find, and neither will you. They even have toy soldiers, model kits, games, children's books, and more. So stop by and check them out on your next visit to Gettysburg, or better yet, order right now online at ForTheHistorian.com and mention that you heard about them on Addressing Gettysburg in the Note to Seller box, and they will refund you your shipping. And if you call 717-685-5207 or stop by the store on your next visit and mention us, you'll get 20% off retail price. That's ForTheHistorian.com or 717-685-5207. Hey, summer is here, and Gettysburg's licensed battlefield guides are ready to kick off another full season of specialized battlefield walks on their favorite subjects. First, enjoy an educational stroll at sunset with Tuesday evening walks through history starting on June 6th and going until the end of August. Then tours switch to Sunday afternoons and go to the end of October. The walks cost $35 each, and registration is required in advance. And don't forget, from September 22nd until the 24th, the Association of Licensed Battlefield Guides is proud to present Oak Ridge Attack and Defense. Three days, 10 licensed battlefield guides, seven battlefield tours, and much more. For the full schedule and registration, and don't forget you have to register for these, visit GettysburgTourGuides.org. GettysburgTourGuides.org. You've heard us promote various ways that you can help us keep the show going, but one way we haven't pushed too much is our sutlery at AddressingGettysburg.com slash shop. That's a shame because we have designs over there by talented artists like Ty DeWitt of 1863 Designs and Mike Stretch of the Heritage Depot. So now we're promoting it. Buying shirts, hoodies, mugs, and other items from our sutlery not only helps us keep the lights on, but it also helps guys like Ty and Mike, and it helps spread the word about the show every time you wear an item or you sip from your mug. So head over to AddressingGettysburg.com slash shop and grab some merch. It's the perfect Christmas gift for the Gettys nerd in your family. That's AddressingGettysburg.com slash shop. If you're a lover of history, then go to TRHistorical.com. There you'll find apparel, drinkware, decor, and more featuring a wide range of interests from the ancient world to the Cold War. Looking to make an impression with the perfect gift? Well, TR Historical now offers gift cards and a vintage wrapping service for a truly unique presentation. And our listeners will receive 10% off plus free shipping in the U.S. when you use promo code GBERG1863. So go to trhistorical.com TR Historical for the love of history. You're listening to the Addressing Gettysburg Podcast with Matt Callery. All right, and we are back now from that wonderful commercial break, and we're talking about Daniel's Brigade with LBG Lewis Trot, and we're going to get to questions from our patrons over at patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg. That is how you get to ask questions on and ask a guy. I didn't get to hear your name. You know, you're driving around in the car, and your kid's in the back seat, you know, you're making them listen to the show, and they hate it because it's boring history, and you know, this guy's weird or whatever. And then uh, you go, wait, son, listen. And they hear your name. And then suddenly you're cool in their eyes. And for just $15 a month, just uh, the, that's actually a sip of Starbucks coffee is $15 a month. If you can go one sip less yeah. each month and actually support someone who really cares about you and your education, not like Starbucks, they don't give a flying F about you. Patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg. Okay, here we go. <laughs> 
Uh, Bill Let's Corn. Wild Bill Let's Corn. He says Daniel's brigade was given the honor to carry the core colors into battle on July 1st. Coincidentally, they also took the most casualties. Is it safe to assume that by carrying the colors, they would have been targeted for or targeted, or this just uh, an, the unlucky lottery to face the first corps of the Army of the Potomac? Whew. What? Anyway, you understood that, of course, did, didn't you? Could you repeat that? <laughs> I don't know if I could. Um, I don't think. Uh, I don't think the one has anything to do with the other. Now, what were the core colors of the flag? Which flag? The, the national flag. They 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 were presented. The, the division was – maybe it was the core. No, it was, it was – Ewell was presented the, the stainless – yeah, yeah, brand new flag. Mm -hmm. um, the national while, flag. Yeah, while they're in Carlisle. Right. And Daniels – it was presented to Daniels Brigade. Everybody seemed to be passing it on because, like, Ewell passed it on to Rhodes. Rhodes is like, yeah. oh, great. Let's get, pass it on to Daniel. And Which is – I always found sort of interesting, not interesting enough to, to really look into it, but Daniels is new – to the Army of Northern Virginia. Right. Oh, so maybe it's like, why, are, why is he getting in? Yeah. yeah. Like kind and, of a, right. Yeah. So, but when they're, when, when the attack, you know, begins uh, on the afternoon of July 1st, Rhodes' division attack, I don't know if they're carrying that flag with them. They, they have their flags, you know, mm -hmm. but... The flag carrying that flag and, and suffering that amount of um, casualties, I don't. I'm pretty sure are not related. It's where they're attacking. They're attacking um, again. We w went over it. Stone's brigade and they've got Cutler's brigade on their left um, left flank, sort of um, at an angle. And then they've got that artillery down on Seminary Ridge. Reynolds and Stewart's batteries firing mm -hmm. into them. So. It's just the the Union Army. So the second part is what the the factor is. It's the first corps of the Union Army that is the reason they have all those casualties. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have anything to do with the flag. It is. It has. Um, since he asked that, it does bring to mind again. Why does Daniel's brigade get that flag? Yeah, that there might not be a reason. I couldn't find an answer yeah. to that, but maybe it was just because you know, hey, welcome to the army. <laughs> Here's your yeah, flag. Well, welcome, welcome to this army because they've been around. They just that's what I mean. Been, yeah, you, yeah, you know, yeah, under Lee. Um, so. But uh, but my question is though, why would anybody want to carry that flag? I mean, you can't tell me that it it had to take a few battles for them to realize it looks like a surrender flag. Uh, from afar. Yeah. I mean, you had to take one look at that and go, I'm not carrying a white flag into battle. Yeah. Although that could be a good ruse, right? Yeah. You know, well, you go. Well, the 149th moves their flag. Exactly. To draw artillery fire away from their main line. That's right. So, That's yes. right. And so when they attack, that flag most likely stays with the, the headquarters element of the Buell's Corps. It right. doesn't go into the, it's, it's not part of the line. Coming down to Oak Ridge, you don't right. see that flag coming towards you. Right. So, all right. Jamie Umstad says, uh, were Daniel's original orders to follow behind Iverson's brigade? Did he make an adjustment on the fly to avert the same disaster? And how did uh, Junius Daniels retreat from Gettysburg? Um, well, we talked about that. The, the leaving the Gettysburg. Retreat, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the first part his his orders are to protect the right flank of Iverson and coordinate with the right flank. Again, I think we mentioned it. When Iverson starts his movement, his brigade does this left oblique sort of movement. So that's a, it's a bit of a curve on a map instead of going straight. And so, and straight would have meant towards the Southwest more so than South. Mm -hmm. um, if you look on a map. So he, <laughs> he goes less southwest and more south, and that brings him in line with Oak Ridge, and he's coming towards that stone wall where the Union Brigade under Henry Baxter is lined up behind. When he turns, Daniel's Brigade doesn't turn with him, and that creates this gap that just gets wider and wider, mm -hmm. and then eventually Iverson's Brigade gets decimated, and they fall back in it's too late to do anything with Iverson's brigade at that point anyway. So it's more in line that Iverson's brigade makes a movement that Daniels is not expecting that opens up this gap. And he's unable to really 
help Iverson's um, left flank. The 12th North Carolina North Carolina Regiment is on the right flank of Iverson's brigade, and that that regiment out of his brigade, Iverson's brigade, takes the least casualties because they don't go in straight towards the wall. They're on the right flank of Iverson's brigade, and the way the terrain there is, it sort of protects them. Mm-hmm. So, but it's still this movement that takes Iverson away from Daniel's brigade, and it's not that Daniel leaves him hanging out to dry. He certainly doesn't. It's just that he he executes a movement Daniels is not uh, expecting, and so he's going to go on his way where the danger is in front of him, and that's to his left front is. Um, Cutler's Brigade falling back to Sheets Woods, and then Stone's Brigade out there by the Chambersburg Pike. Okay. Philip May says, I don't recall if his official action report from Gettysburg was quoted or resourced or even written for that matter. Does his after action report exist in the ORs? Who asked this? Philip May. Why, Philip? Yes, it does. <laughs> Where where can he find it? He can find it in the ORs. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Volume Next question. Twenty seven mm-hmm. is the th- three volumes of the Gettysburg. Part two has all the Confederate re- uh, after action reports, and page five sixty four is where it wow, begins. There you I go. I have it right here in front of my hands. Amazing. There you go. But Amazing. Yes, it was published along with all. Um, You'll find when you go through the ORs, it'll start from big to little. So you'll have a core report, which is a culmination of all the lower commands reports rolled into that. And then you'll have um, the various divisions. And within below the divisions, you'll have the brigades. And below the brigades, you'll have all the regiments. So um, under Daniels, after Daniels' report, you'll have the reports of the individual regiments under his command. Brian Jackson says, what created the delay of Daniel's brigade entering the fight on July 1st? My understanding was that he was to follow on Iverson's right, but that didn't happen. We kind of touched, well, we did touch on this before, but um, go ahead, reiterate it for him. And, you know, originally what they're thinking is when O'Neill moves, Iverson's supposed to move and they don't move at the same time. Mm -hmm. Now, if you stand out there in the, the two different places, they can't see each other. So communication is definitely lacking on this day. Um... So by the time O'Neill's repulsed, that's when Iverson starts to move. And again, when he moves, he does this left oblique, and it creates this gap. Um, I have to think that he doesn't move at the same time Iverson moves because there's no communication. And Iverson's clearly not leading anything. He doesn't have his skirmishers out in front. So they should have been close enough to see each other. Um I've been to Iverson's spot. I've been to O'Neill's spot, but it's sort of hard to get without getting in trouble exactly where Daniels was. Uh-huh. You know, you get off property. You, are you, when, when you say O'Neill's and Iverson's and Daniels' spots, you're talking about the individual, not the brigade. Yeah, where the brigades are. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh yeah, okay. Yeah. I thought you wanted to. I, I thought you were sort of the center of each brigade. I like to get to uh-huh. if I can to imagine what it looked like. Sure. Um, you're getting farther out. Um, to the northwest with Daniel, so there's, you know, farmers are growing stuff. I don't know if it's park property or what. So I try, mm-hmm. to, I try to within means stay within the limits of things. I'm not right, going right. to say anything else. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Tim Dolan says, while Daniel's brigade was locked in combat with Stone's brigade, how did Mississippi soldiers swoop in and rush the colors of the 149th? Why didn't Daniel's brigade get the prize instead? I think I think the Mississippians can see it. It's on the, it's in between the Chambersburg Pike and the West End Railroad Cut. And on the other side of the cut is Daniel's Brigade. So when they, they're fighting with the troops um, and as they're coming up, they're trying to get to the cut. To their right is Davis's Brigade, what's left of it, to Daniel's right. And they're looking. Oh, yeah. Um, well, and he does ask Daniel for help, doesn't he? And Daniel's like, nah. Who, Davis? uh, I'm sorry. Daniel asks Davis for help. Yeah. And Davis is like, no, we've we've already been through this. Yeah. We're not doing this again. (laughs) And I haven't read any of this anywhere, why one brigade goes after it and the other one doesn't. And it's the the Mississippians under um, General Davis's brigade that go after it and get it. They can see it because they are further along the railroad bed. They are northwest. 
of the Western Railroad cut because it goes yes. that's the, the direction it runs. It's not north to south. It's northwest to southeast. So they are further northwest of the railroad cut. They can see where the the flag is because the flag is on the southern side of the railroad bed. Daniel's brigade is coming up to the railroad bed. They got their hands full with people actually shooting at them near the Chambersburg Pike. And then the 149th crosses the pike, comes up to the railroad cut in the bed. So they're dealing with that. And I think it's just a matter of the Mississippians can see it. They're not gainfully employed at that point. They're not occupied by Union brigades. They're not actively fighting any of these Union brigades like Daniel's brigade is doing. Right. Daniel's brigade... You know, the capturing that flag is not going to do them any good at this point. They've got Cutler on one side, the left side, and Stone's Brigade directly in front of them. That's their immediate concern, not the flag. And I think the Mississippians just see the opportunity and seize it. But that's that's my opinion of all that. I've never read why one goes after it and the other one doesn't. That's just my thinking, looking at a map and looking at how they move. Joe Wingate says, did Daniel's brigade fight in the railroad cut against the 6th Wisconsin and Rufus Dawes? How far did they, uh, how did they fare after the first day and did Daniel survive the uh, fight at Gettysburg? Okay, so we answered that yes, he survived. Uh, they fared, meh, lost almost half their men. Uh, and go ahead, did he, did he fight no. the railroad cut against Dawes? No, because no. Dawes is in the morning. Um and a different morning part. fight, and he's fighting in the 6th Wisconsin, goes over with the 14th Brooklyn and 95th New York to the middle, the center railroad cut, not the western railroad cut. Balthazar says, mm-hmm. why did Rhodes set up his artillery and remove the opportunity of a better surprise attack slash ambush on the Union right? For whatever reason, I don't know. When Rhodes shows up, he thinks he's about to get attacked. He sees the opportunity to attack the flank of the end of the first corps that's baxter's brigade along seminary ridge or oak ridge excuse me and then he sees this other threat coming through the town setting up on what we call the gettysburg plain that's the 11th corps and he thinks he writes afterwards that he thinks he's going to be attacked therefore he will do the attacking and he, he gets his artillery out and starts firing and page's battery and i, I didn't This is not an original thought. I think it was Rob Abbott, again, my mentor, who I first heard this from. Reese's Pieces. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, That's that's clever because you call a gun a piece. Yeah, Reese's Uh, Pieces and Page's Battery are on the uh, southern slope of Oak Hill, and they are a prime target for the artillery of the 11th Corps that sets up in the neighborhood of Howard Avenue down there to use it, make it easier for people to visualize where it's at. And they just get ate up because they're against this nice backdrop. There's nowhere for them to go. And Dilger's battery especially just tears into them. But Rhodes, for whatever reason, thinks he's about to get attacked um, when he sees all these Union forces in front of him. One's already there. The 11th Corps is starting to set up and he gets his artillery out and starts firing. Um, he would have been better off if he's going to attack against Lee's orders. If he's going to attack, he would have been better off getting his infantry in place as soon as he can and just going with them. Right. He may have been able to knock Baxter off that line sooner and then deal with the 11th Corps because mm-hmm. he still got early, you know, Buell still got Early's division coming in too. So it's just, it's not roads against the world here. But Rhodes, if he gets his infantry set up and just, if he's going to attack, immediately exercises better command and goes with it, they might have knocked Baxter off with a coordinated attack of the Iverson and O'Neill. And then on the other end of that, Doles and um, Daniels' brigades on the two opposite ends knock the first corps off of Oak Ridge. And if you do that, things are going to get pushed south a lot quicker. So, and then you don't, if that happens, and these are a bunch of what ifs, but if that happens, the Confederates don't incur all the casualties they do on that first day that come back to haunt them. Mm, on the third. Yeah. 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 
All right. Well, very good, Lewis. Thank you Thank very you. much it's, for doing this. I love these. It's, you know, I wish I lived closer. I'd do more. Yeah. But well, it is well, what it is. Well, you come up on I Saturdays. We'll do two time. like yeah. we always do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, uh, well, you can all, always come out and meet Lewis and get a tour with Lewis for free once a month. Uh, go to addressinggettysburg.com to see what the schedule is for our Get Out of the Car tours. Um, and if you'd like to hire him for a tour yourself, you can contact me, Matt, at Addressing Gettysburg, and I'll put you guys in touch. And more importantly, you know, that commercial break that you guys uh, had to sit through, man, that was long and annoying, right? Wasn't it? Well, you want to get rid of those because I'm a patron. Cause, <laughs> exactly. And, and you want to you uh, not have to sit through commercial breaks, ladies and gentlemen? Well, we need a thousand patrons and then we'll be able to not do commercials. That's However, what we need. I will say, yeah, and this is this is a, a not a shameless plug. It's a plug I learned about for the historian from the from the podcast. commercials. Yeah, and when we did the seminary event, was it that day? I don't know if it was that day. I came up for something. I don't and know you and you used the. I went to. For the historian right. for the first time and spent too much money. Uh, but I didn't see, need here's the, code the thing because if, I spent so much money. If we had a, let's, a thousand patrons, then we wouldn't need to do commercials, but we would still talk about these places because yeah. we patronize them. Um, but you know how it goes now is you gotta you gotta make a living. You gotta put yeah. money on the table, and with uh, the inflation the way it is, uh, and it doesn't seem to be uh, going away anytime soon, you gotta yeah. make every cent you can. And so uh, that's it. We appreciate your patronage over at patreoncom slash and and that that is it for us today, folks. We gotta stop this before the battery dies on the recorder because there's no electricity in the studio. I'll have so, to repeat everything I and said. And we're gonna again. do it all over again. <laughs> uh, so that's it. Thank you all for listening, and thanks. we'll talk to you next time. Are you a reenactor or living historian? Or maybe you're a war of rights player and want to bring Esprit de Corps to your team. Well then you need the badge maker, the leading provider of Civil War and other historical badges and insignias. Mention this ad with an attached message in your order and receive a free surprise gift. I myself bought a metal second corps badge and it always starts a conversation when I wear it. So hit up the badge maker at CivilWarCorpsBadges.com. Something for everyone and anyone. Our hearts so stout have got us fame For soon tis known from whence we came Wherever we go they dread the name Of Gary Owen in glory Instead of spa we'll drink down there And pay the